Senate Committee on Education will come to order. Uh, clerk will call the roll. Taylor? Here. Lucia? Present. Betancourt? Campbell? Here. Fallon? Here. Hall? Hughes? Paxton? Here. Powell? Here. Watson? West? Betancourt? Here. Late night, Sir Court. <laughs> it's a tax bill, like an education bill. Yeah. Lucky you get to go home before noon, for midnight, or noon the next day. Well, welcome to season three, episode one <laughs> of the uh, Senate Committee on Education, with Larry Taylor as the chair. Uh, we do have some new characters in this this season, um, and we, we certainly miss those who are not with us on. As, as we continue on this, but we, we are looking forward to great things, frankly, from this, this committee, this session. I foresee monumental, uh, literally transformative things going on for public education, working with our, our friends in the House on the Education Committee there as well, but we are going to do some monumental great things for the kids of Texas and their students, and frankly, for the future of Texas. Uh, I just want to introduce real quick our committee directors, Bridget Harton back here, committee clerk, Mark Williams. Patrick Philpot works with me. And uh, members, if you'd like to introduce yourselves and your staff that's working with you, Senator Betcourt, we'll start with you down there. Okay, well, still uh, season three, but in the same seat. Yeah. Uh, um, and in the same seat, my chief and also education specialist, Mark Salstow. I'm Senator Beverly Powell from Tarrant County. I'm excited to uh, be on the education committee. Looking. There we go. Looking forward to the opportunity to get to work for the children of the state of Texas. I'm a 10-year school board trustee, so this is a matter that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, supporting me today is Avery Martinez, who is our education legislative expert in our office, so we're both thrilled to be here. And I'm Angela Paxton <coughs> from McKinney, uh, SD8. Um, I'm a 22-year educator. Uh, high school math teacher and guidance counselor, so I'm thrilled to be able to participate in, in this way and to make a difference in a new way uh, for the students of Texas. And I am joined by Emily Landon, my general counsel and policy director, right back here. And I'm thrilled to have her expertise and support. Well, thank you. And we appreciate both of you bringing your education experience to this committee. Of course, Senator Lucio is our other former educator. Senator Lucio, my vice chair. Good morning. Chair. Um, I just want to welcome everyone here to, uh, this morning and let you know that I share the same excitement, Commissioner, as um, Chairman Taylor and other members of the, all members of this committee. As a matter of fact, the whole Senate. Um, in, in what we feel um, historically will happen this, uh, this session. Uh, I want to, you know, just let you know that each one of you <coughs> will play an integral part in the process. Each one of you will have an opportunity to sit at the table and expound on the issues and articulate what you feel is most important for the children of our great state. Um, I am uh, very pleased and proud to once again have by my son, and I look up to him because I'm going to tell him to stand, and you'll know why I look up to him. <laughs> Chris Lasore right behind me. Stand up, Chris. <laughs> Chris has been with me several sessions now, and uh, we have a new addition, a young lady who, very bright and uh, energetic, uh, Sadie Schmeck. Uh, where's Sadie? Sadie, stand up and think about. Thank you very much, and once again, um, let's work together. Um, my slogan this year is, we're in this together, the whole state, one state, one family. Let's, uh, let's get it done. Here, Thank here. you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Sir Fallon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Pat Fallon. I am an elementary school graduate. <laughs> and, uh, well, love that uh, experience. many of my other accomplishments. Uh, <laughs> my parents are retired school teachers, so this, of course, is near and dear to my heart as well. And, and to echo Senator Lucio's comments, you know, one state, one family. That, that We can get a lot done, and it's, this is a special and magic time, and we have a unique, unique opportunity and very much looking forward to doing that because um, we we just live in the greatest state and, you know, in, in the best country the world has ever known. 
uh, and this, it's special. So Patricia Vojak is with me. She's behind me. Patricia, if you can stand up. She's been around the Capitol for years. She's a former uh, chief of staff and general counsel as well, so she's going to be helping us out with education issues, and she's a graduate of Farley Dixon University and New England Law, but we won't hold that against her. And uh, thank you so much, and looking forward to a great session. All right, Senator Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, once again, um, I'm honored to be on the Education Committee and uh, serving with the members that are on this committee. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the transformation that I believe that we can do, and I think our focus most certainly just needs to be on the children, everything in the classroom on the for the children. Uh, that's where our brightest future lies. And we do a disservice if we put more emphasis on bricks and mortar and not our children. So I'm looking forward to things we can do to promote that ideology. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I have Addison Reagan with me, wife Reagan, Addison, um, who is um, my, our specialist in education. Thank right. you. Well, thank, thank you. you. And just for the audience and those watching, there are numerous me committee meetings going on right now, so we're going to have a, a number of people probably moving in and out. Um, just so you know where our other members are. Uh, members, you should have received a draft of the proposed committee rules. Does anyone have any questions regarding the rules? Senator Betancourt? Move adoption. Move adoption. Second. Any second. We have a second. Any further discussion on the rules? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Are they are passed. Thank you very much. Um, we have invited testimony. This is our opening up. And I thought it would be best to have our Education Commissioner come before us today and give us the state of education. We've had a lot of state of the states and state of the judiciary. Today we're going to have the state of education. I'm sorry we couldn't get the big hall and all, but um, this will work. We, have, we are very pleased to have Commissioner Mike Morath as our commissioner. He has done a great job and is doing a great job for the students of Texas and moving our system forward and getting better results for all of our students. Commissioner Morath, if you would introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, uh, Chairman Taylor. Thank you for the kind introduction. My name is Mike Morath, Commissioner of the Texas Education Agency. Senators, uh, 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 in front of you, you should have a packet, and I'm going to walk through uh, the packet. And it covers a, a few core topics. Um, it certainly does not cover every topic. Um, but you also have, independent of the packet, um, a document that we have produced. Um, this is the second time that TEA has done this. Last year, we started. Um, uh, producing a state of the state of public education annual report um, and so 2017 was the first one in 2018 there is a new um, annual report on the state of public education in Texas um, and it covers um, a host of different issues in terms of our current performance um, uh, current key strategic initiatives um, uh, assessment and accountability um, and towards the end um, even school finance so um, hopefully that will be a resource for you. Um, the, the reason that we produced this is because um, as the uh, veterans on this committee understand and as, um, as certainly the new additions given your um, background in public ed, uh, this is perhaps the most complicated set of topics that we're going to um, discuss as humans uh, because the work that we do in public education is to take three and four year old bundles of energy. And, and Commissioner, we also have our new pocket edition. That's right, even the sh a short version of it, it doubles as an eye test. And apparently our pockets are getting bigger. <laughs> that, that's right. Yeah, that's so right. larger pockets, but still a pocket edition. Absolutely. So this is a great wealth of information. Remember, I, I generally carry this around. There's a lot of different Thank statistics you. in here that are very helpful. I generally carry that in my wallet. Absolutely. Appreciate you doing that. So uh, ho again, hopefully that is, uh, it just helps synthesize the complexity of the uh, challenge in front of us and how well the system is working, where the bright spots are, where the challenges are, um, any headwinds that we have um, to, to uh, go in and, and then tailwinds that are back. So uh, with that, let's just talk about current um, education performance. This is on slide three of your uh, packet. It also happens to be on page three or four of the annual report. Um, there, there are any number of data points that we can look at to, to try to assess systemic performance. Um, we have chosen a few key points because it covers the entirety of the continuum. So we start with kindergarten readiness. Um, at, in, at five years of age, how well um, are students prepared for pre-literacy and pre-numeracy lessons when they walk into kindergarten? Um, fast forward five years after that, um, at the end of third grade, um, uh, what percentage of students are meeting grade level expectations in reading and math based upon the curriculum standards? 
uh, adopted uh, by the state. Um, fast forward five more years, what percentage of students are meeting uh, grade level knowledge and skills in math and in, in English um, in reading again? Uh, the next, uh, um, um, the next uh, uh, bar you'll see is SAT and ACT, and if you'll permit me, I'm going to skip that for now and come back to it in a moment. Um, then you see graduation rate, uh, which has now risen to 90%. Um, uh, most of these numbers are at or near all-time highs. Um, this number in particular also puts us in the top five of all states in the country, um, which again is a, a testimony to the um, tenacious work of a huge number of very dedicated educators and administrators working in schools around the state, and, and we should congratulate them at every opportunity for the hard work. Um, uh, after graduation, 55% um, uh, uh, of students um, uh, make it into some form of college, and I, I use that phrase loosely because it could be a trade school, it could be an associate's degree uh, program, um, and this uh, is based upon data both inside and nationally um, in the state of Texas. Um, and then our sort of North Star, and when we think about what it is that we're preparing students for, um, the, the, the um, current state strategic plan aligned uh, from higher education down to K-12, um, uh, supported by the governor, is that by the year 2030, we want 60 percent of young people in Texas to possess some form of post-secondary credential. That could be a trade credential, could be an associate's degree, could be a bachelor's degree. Um, and when you look at where we are with recent high school graduates, um, which is different than how we measure all of 60 by 30, because when you think about 60 by 30, we're looking at uh, young people that age 25 um, to 35. But of recent high school graduates, um, six years after the most recent cohort of data that's available. So they graduated in 2011, we fast forward six years later. What percentage of students possess a uh, trade credential, uh, an associate's degree, or a bachelor's degree? And the number right now is one in four. Um, so um, uh, we have a long way to go in order to deliver on the promise of our public education system for all of our students and in order to ensure that we have a citizenry that is um, educated um, uh, to the degree that they can defend their liberties and uh, continue um, the sustained economic growth of the state. Um, uh, I don't want to, though, um, paint a picture um, of solely of challenge because the story of public education in Texas is also a story of pretty significant continuous improvement. Um, so if you turn to slide four, you'll see a picture um, just focused on SAT and ACT. So these are all high school graduates, regardless whether they took the SAT or ACT or not, but if they took it, um, what percentage of high school graduates are deemed passing um, uh, according to the standards um, espoused by SAT and ACT themselves? Um, and what you see is that for non-low income students, um, that's the blue bar at the top, there's been a six percentage point rise in uh, college readiness over the last 20 years, which is again a reflection of significant work um, by educators around the state to improve outcomes for kids. For low income students, you also see a rise. 1.8 percent um, uh, more low income students are ready for college today than they were 20 years ago. Um, but you, it's also pretty clear that the, there, this highlights some challenges too because we are getting better faster for middle class kids than we are for low income kids. And the average for the state as a whole basically has not changed. It was a 16, 17% 20 years ago, it's 16, 17% today. So how is it that we have gotten better for our <coughs> middle class kids and we've gotten better for our poor kids, but we as a state have not gotten better? And the answer it becomes obvious on the next slide, slide five. We have a lot more low income students than we did 20 years ago in the state of Texas. Um, so the, um, uh, our schools are making progress, and they're making progress even as there are, have been significant demographic shifts in Texas public schools. Um, uh, there's a, so there's been a significant rise in student poverty in the state of Texas. Um, what we believe is necessary um, uh, to, to do this is a strategic plan that is focused um, narrowly on the highest leverage points that will deliver the most good for the most kids. And you see that on slide six. In my first six months on the job, I traveled all over the state listening to parents, teachers, principals, superintendents, board members, community leaders, business leaders. And from that, we have four key strategic priorities um, oriented towards uh, achieving this goal for all kids, that every child, regardless of where they live, regardless of what they look like, regardless of their uh, uh, family circumstance, um, whether they're in rural Texas, suburban Texas, or urban Texas, that every child is prepared for success. And the four key levers that we think um, need to be um, focused on most relentlessly 
is first uh, loving on those who love on our kids. We've got to recruit, support, and retain teachers and principals. And we know that the teacher is the most, single most important in-school factor that affects student outcomes. Um, and there's many challenges uh, associated with the teaching profession um, uh, that, w that need to be um, addressed. Um, but even if we wave a magic wand um, and have significantly improved our ability to recruit, support, and retain teachers and principals, you still think about those five-year-olds that enter the system ill-equipped for um, learning uh, literacy and numeracy um, in kindergarten. And so what are we doing to shift the attention and resources of the system into the early grades, into the early years, so that we build a strong foundation for, um, uh, for all of our kids in reading and math? Likewise, um, for students at the other end of the spe spectrum, students in high school that today will raise their hand somewhere in Texas and say, teacher, when am I ever going to use this? Um, so what do we do to, to support the re-engineering efforts at the high school level to connect high school to career and college um, and make sure that it is both relevant and rigorous for all of our kids? Because if a student, their 12th grade year is coasting um, to finals, uh, going to prom and homecoming, we are doing that student a disservice because life is not about coasting, it is about hard work and self-sacrifice. Um, and last but not least, what do we do to wrap our arms around our most struggling campuses mm -hmm. to change the trajectory of students at those campuses so that the promise of public education um, uh, is, is a reality for all of our students. Those are the four key priorities that we think we need to focus on and they rest on some foundational pillars, chief among them. Um, transparency, the, the expectations that we have for students um, and, the, and, and writ large the accountability system that we use to track uh, that progress and capacity, how we're investing um, because the spirit is generally willing everywhere but the body is sometimes weak. So um, that is a, a, a short synopsis of our um, agency strategic plan. Uh, the resources that we use, um, broadly speaking, you see on slide seven. This is an all-in picture of every form of public education spending. That's the Foundation School Program formula. Those are riders. That's our budget. That is um, um, uh, periodic investments in the teacher retirement system. Um, uh, so this is an all-in spend, uh, spending picture um, that, that shows um, the level of spending and how it breaks down between state, local, federal and um, uh, for the purposes of, the, of whether recapture is state or local we just isolate it out and you can consider it any way you want. So um, uh, moving on. Real uh, quick on that one. Yes, sir. Do you have one that shows an inflation adjusted line on there? That's what um, I'm I don't have it in this packet but we definitely have that um, and can, can distribute it to the, to the committee. If you would, thank you. Um, and this one you'll notice is not per pupil, this is total, um, but the per pupil number looks very similar to this as well. So we'll get you inflation adjusted both per pupil and up aggregate. Perfect. Um, so um, much discussion for the last 20 or 30 years at the state level has, has wrestled around issues related to the accountability system in public education. So I thought I would do a little bit of a dive on the accountability system in particular uh, and then the assessments uh, that um, are used underneath that accountability system. So I, I actually think it's important to, when talking about the accountability system to sort of set the stage for why it is that we do all of this. Um, because at its core, this is about um, a moral commitment that the legislature has um, adopted in statute um, and has asked the State Board of Education to make specific, which is that we believe that all children can learn and achieve at high levels. Um, it is a, that is not just a moral statement, it is an active legislative policy in the state of Texas. And, um, and so at its core, the accountability system is about understanding expectations at a granular level and then measuring whether or not we are meeting those expectations in our support of students. So if you see slide 10, what has happened is, this, is as a function of state law, the State Board of Education adopts specific learning standards for what students should know and be able to do at every grade level. So for example, um, we don't have a, an esoteric belief in high expectations for kids. We believe, for example, that every third grader in Texas should have memorized their times tables. It's one of the curriculum standards. Um, uh, and usually the, the, student, the curriculum standards as adopted by the SBOE are more complicated than that in terms of how they're written. So you'll see on slide 10-1, which, uh, which is a curriculum st expectation. This is an expectation that we have for all students in third grade. Um, that a third grader should be able to represent one and two step problems involving addition and subtraction of whole numbers to a thousand using pictorial models, number lines, and equations. And for those of you who have ever said, you know, this is, a, I've got somebody that knows a lot about math, um, we need to put them in the classroom right away. 
Um, when you begin learning these student expectations, you realize it's actually a lot more complicated than that because it's not just about whether you know math, it's about whether you can distill mathematical knowledge in a way that the human brain can acquire it um, in a room of third graders. This is, um, this is a very complicated profession and we need to recognize the degree of difficulty um, that all of our teachers face every day in the classroom. Um, and when you think about then, again, back to the accountability system, we have a, a set of assessments that is tightly aligned with, this, uh, with these student expectations. So here's an actual STAR question aligned to that, um, um, that student expectation. An art teacher has 736 crayons. She threw away 197 broken crayons. Then she bought 150 more crayons. Which equation shows how to find the number of crayons the art teacher has now? And I, this is, it's a, I'm, I'm going to spend some time on this because this is foundational to so much of what we do in public education. So uh, you'll have to pardon, pardon the detail on this topic. The first word in that student expectation is a verb, and the verb is represent. It is not solve. It is represent. And when you think about this, this is about communicating um, um, abstract reasoning skills for kids. And so this, um, this question doesn't ask them to solve the problem. It asks them, can you figure out this logic challenge and represent it in an equation? Um, and that's what it says to do. Use an equation. These are all whole numbers under 1,000. And there's addition and subtraction. And this is two steps. This, when you, when, when you talk to people about what the STAR test is, this is, this is what it is. It is a set of questions that are aligned to these student expectations that we ask kids at the end of the year um, that if we have properly supported them, that all of our students should be able to answer these questions. Um, so um, uh, that s rolls into, uh, with a great deal of complexity, the accountability system, which is really, um, I actually don't even like the term accountability because it puts people in a negative mindset. Um, what I think about it is a performance management system. We don't live in a utopia. How are we doing today? Is it better than we did last week? And next week, will we be better than that? And so we have to have clear information about performance so that you can um, support a, a culture and mindset of continuous improvement for students. Um, we also, um, and there's much um, topic uh, in discussion about this, people think, can sometimes think of this as punitive. But we do not have an accountability system in Texas uh, because um, we want to be punitive with either students or, or staff. We have it because the evidence shows that it, this is good for children. A study done on the Texas accountability system um, in the late 90s, early 2000s identified a low-performing student in Campus A, a low-performing student in Campus B. And, tr and in Campus B, there were accountability pressures placed on the adults in that campus. And what happens is as the, as the researchers followed these students over time is that these students, um, they did better academically um, uh, in, in a whole host of measures. They went to college at higher rates. And, and perhaps I think most importantly when you think about the public policy implications is that these students were making more money at 25 than their peers that did not, um, were not in campuses that suffered accountability pressure. Like we do this because it is good for students. But it is hard. It is hard for the adults. It creates a great deal of um, uh, management and leadership challenges in, in our campuses. It creates a great deal of, uh, of, of, of ramifications that are hard to overcome. But it is, in fact, a student-focused um, uh, policy that has been delivering results for kids. Um, our, our A through F system, um, which is new in Texas, um, was developed uh, over a two-year uh, period based upon feedback from uh, essentially everyone in Texas, because virtually everyone in Texas had a hot sports opinion on the A through F system. Um, it is a tiered accountability system. Um, uh, so the old system was pass-fail. Um, and here you have a system that um, can differentiate average from good from great. Um, uh, we, we designed based upon the law t sort of two philosophical commitments is that everyone should be able to mathematically achieve an A. If, if it's not possible for everyone to achieve an A, it's not a performance management system, it's a system of, um, of, of uh, disenfranchisement and disempowerment. So it is in fact mathematically possible for everyone to achieve an A, but it is not easy because if you're de defining what great is, not everyone is great. Um, uh, the other thing is, um, historically the approach to accountability in Texas was there were rule changes every single year that changed um, the, the very definition of, of, what, of how we define school performance. 
and we're committed to a five-year process of, of the, as few changes as possible so that you can create an actual continuous improvement uh, framework so that you can compare performance last year with this year and you can know that this year's performance was, uh, was objectively better because the standards are the same. Um, the, the design of the system is based around three um, frameworks. One is student achievement. This is what students know and can do at the end of the school year. This is very Darwinian. Uh, I don't care what you overcame. I don't care how hard it was. I just care whether you know and can do certain skills. Um, and when you think about the, the reason for that way of evaluating um, schools is because that is the way life evaluates kids. When you go to apply for a job, your employer might be interested in what uh, obstacles you overcame, but they're going to be very interested in what skills you can bring to the to table today. But we have to recognize that schools are growth institutions. They, they, they support the growth of, of our little humans. Um, and so we also measure schools by the progress that kids make, um, how, how much they grew year over year, and the relative performance of our campus. And the, uh, the A3F accountability system gives schools the higher rating of either growth or achievement because we want a system that rewards both high levels of achievement and high levels of educator impact while also maintaining focus on individual groups of students so that students who may need more attention, um, the system creates incentives for those students to receive more attention. Um, the results of, this, of the accountability system, um, you can see uh, sort of first year highlights on slide 20. Uh, the distribution of A, B, C, D, F districts um, is largely featured and you can see that it, um, it's, it's, it spreads the gamut. Um, I think of more interest is slide 21. The, the, pop, the relationship between poverty and, and, and uh, school ratings is not particularly strong. It's also non-existent, um, but that does not mean that the A3F system is unfair. It means that it is much harder in life um, to have been born poor than to be born rich. Um, and this um, shows up in a bunch of different places. Um, uh, so the, the relationship between poverty and performance in the, in the accountability system is a, is a moderate relationship and I think of particular interest is that you have a, a large number of very high performing school districts that are also very high poverty. Um, Sherryland, um, United, McAllen, Los Fresnes, Edinburgh, HEB, IDEA, Brownsville. These are uh, school districts that are getting phenomenal results um, with high concentrations of students from poverty. And um, it is happening so much in Texas that it is not uh, right to think of this as a miracle. It is right to think of this as tenacious hard work and practices that need to be spread. Senator Lucio has a question. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Commissioner, for what you're doing at this point. I wanted to just let you know that I'm fully aware of the work that has been done, obviously, over the years that has impacted children with, that live in high poverty and the difference it has made for them uh, in terms of the feeding programs, universal feeding program in Brownsville. Uh, they are not getting sick. They're not in the nursing office, nurse's office. They're, they're uh, obviously learning uh, because studies at the University of Texas has indicated that that is certainly something that has to happen if we are to expect them to learn. They can on an empty stomach. So the nutrition in those areas, Brownsville and throughout the valley, based on legislation that has happened in the last eight years or so, uh, has really helped the cause. But there are other factors involved in that poverty cycle that they live in that obviously adds to, in a negative way, uh, for them to <coughs> succeed uh, as much as those that are not in that, that category of living. So I, I certainly want to hear what your thoughts are uh, this session so that we can make part of a the overall package that we work on uh, that will address that issue. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I think the evidence is quite clear that uh, demography is not destiny. But the evidence is also clear that it, um, uh, concentrations of uh, students from challenged um, households is, makes the work much more difficult. Um, and um, I, you have uh, two members in front of me, um, uh, for sure, that were in Senator Betancourt, that were on the School Finance um, uh, Commission uh, for the last year. Uh, and the report that they have authored um, is, I think, um, 
directly designed to address some of these challenges because the level of equity in the Texas school finance system today is actually quite strong. I mean, sometimes Texas gets a bad rap, but in New, in New Jersey, um, uh, a kid can be worth $20,000 more just being across the street, and that's very rare in Texas. Um, and Texas also provides significant um, funding infusion for students um, from needy backgrounds. The School Finance Commission rec report recommendations will build on that commitment to, to equity in, in even more significant ways. So it's, it's, it's very significant, and I uh, certainly want to commend the two members that I see because they worked very hard on that. And it's um, for you know deep nerds on ed policy, it's, um, it is a um, it is a game-changing recommendation, um, and I, um, uh, it's yeah, certainly deep nerds. What, what does that mean? Deep, deep nerds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a game recognized game. So uh, yes, um, um, the, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so, so, um, anyways, so I think that um, the historic commitment that the state has had um, to, um, to um, educating children from all backgrounds um, is commendable, and I think the recommendations of the School Finance Commission build on that. Um, uh, continuing through the... Uh, Mr. Powell. Just, Commissioner, just one thing I wanted to a ask you about, because it just leaped out off the screen, is Brownsville ISD, with economically disadvantaged kids of almost everyone, I mean 96%, and that get a score of an 89, what are they doing there? Yeah, and so whatever they're doing there, we need to do all over the state. Legitimately, their score would have been higher, but they do have they one are, IR campus, yeah. and that um, uh, the, our rules prevent you from getting an A if you have a single failing campus. Otherwise, uh, they, their score would have been several points higher. Um, so we see, um, it's, it's interesting, so if you look at slide 23, it, it, um, it sort of reiterates this point. There are 259 campuses in the state of Texas that have more than 80% of their kids that are economically disadvantaged that achieve an A in the accountability system. And I think 45% of those 259 campuses are in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, it's not just Brownsville, it's, it's several districts and, and, and up to uh, up the Rio Grande Valley, even to the Laredo area. Um, uh, we, see, um, we see high expectations for all kids there very consistently, um, very consistently. Um, educators that are working their tail off, and that's happening everywhere, but educators that are being very creative and they're like, I will not take no for an answer. I am going to make sure that I deliver results for every single kid. Very thoughtful, collaborative, collegial approaches um, um, to... It is, a, it is a culture of continuous improvement. And, you know, that's one thing that you have to, like, teaching as a, as a profession is something that builds upon years of experience. for 20 years of his life. And um, it is that commitment to excellence that we see um, uh, uh, in, in all of these high-performing, low-income schools. Um, but it's also, uh, it starts with a belief in the adults that literally, I actually do believe that all these kids can learn. Um, and when a student fails to master an objective, I'm, I'm not going to sit around and say, well, I guess this, um, the, you know, the student couldn't learn that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think, how do I change practices to make sure that the student learns that? So um, that's that's so much of the battle is that uh, is that uh, it, and, and unfortunately that's not easy to replicate because what I'm really talking about is leadership. Um, you have um, enlightened, bold leaders that are um, committed to getting results for kids. Um, it's part of the uh, accountability system, the A3F accountability system. I wanted to highlight um, uh, uh, a particular design component that I thought was, that was, was uh, very thoughtful of the legislature is to create a local accountability piece in it. It's where uh, local communities can define um, objectives that they think that are important for their kids um, because it is important for kids to learn reading, writing, and math. But there's also a lot more to life than just that. And we at the state have limited data collections on the rest of the story, but the locals have um, more information about it. So we have a number of districts that are piloting these local accountability systems as part of their local goal setting process. And, and we think over time that will uh, be a very positive thing for the state of Texas. Um, in terms of where we are, last year uh, A3F ratings were not issued at the campus level, just the district level. This year they will be issued at the campus level and the local about accountability system will go live. Ratings are issued every year on or about August 15th. Um, uh, that, um, with that, let me transition for a second to assessment because what, are this, what is this accountability system based on? And at the um, high school level and at the district level, 40% of the rating is based on the STAR test, which means 60% uh, of it is based on something else. Um, this is sometimes lost in the, 
in the policy discussion. So 20% is graduation rate, and 40% and is based on, on multiple measures of college, career, and military readiness. Um, but at the elementary and middle school level, we still um, largely have the STAR test, unless the district has adopted uh, additional local accountability domains. And I hear, I hear a lot of conversations about like what the STAR test is and isn't. Um, uh, but it is important to, to sort of think about um, assessment because um, if you have 20 kids in your class and you want them all to learn something, you do in fact need to know whether they have all learned it at the end of the day or the end of the week, the end of the lesson. And for the five students that may not have learned it, you need to know that and have a strategy to address that. Um, this is, um, and so there's a, there's a lot of assessment, both formal and informal, that happens in schools all over the state of Texas. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. There's a lot of brain science research that will tell you that the very act of conducting a, an assessment actually improves knowledge of that subject matter. Um, so um, you have a, a kind of complicated graphic on slide 27 that speaks to sort of different types of assessments, things that are happening every day, you know, quizzes, um, you know, little writing assignments that the, the teachers are doing. Um, all the way up to the STAR test. And you can think about those as the level of granularity they provide to the teacher versus the level of stakes that are placed on the school. Um, and so you have lower stakes but m much more frequent touch points to sort of high stakes, um, single touch point at the end of the year. So the STAR assessment is that, that sort of higher stakes, um, well, high, in our system, sort of the highest stakes um, end of the year assessment. Um, there is a reading and math test basically in grades three through nine. Um, a writing test in a few grades, a science test in a few grades, a social te studies test in a few grades. That's, that's the framework of the STAR test. There's a, there's a couple of optional STAR tests that very few people use in high school as well. <coughs> On slide 29, you have a picture of when those different assessments can happen. They, um, uh, uh, please don't think that every student ha has, a, a, has a, one of these assessment experiences in a given year. So if you're in third grade, you're only going to get two tests at the end of the year. That's, that's the way the system works. So it's different based on grade level and subject. Um, on slide 30, there is a picture of a video. Um, so we don't, um, uh, I don't think I've got multimedia characteristics here, but um, we have a website that we've stood up to try to add transparency to this process um, um, because it, as a, a parent of four myself, um, like I kind of want to know what the STAR test is telling me and why. Um, and so we've, we've created some video resources for parents and for all stakeholders. If you have an interest one day, you can watch a three minute video on our texasassessment.com website kind of explains how we build the STAR test because people ask me that question all the time. How do we, how do we build it? Where does it come from? Um, slide 31, that's actually how we build it. So um, uh, this is the, actually, the crib notes version of how we build it. Um, that's those 17 steps um, because there's actually a lot of um, uh, detail in each one of those uh, uh, steps. Um, but at its core, the objective is to come out with a, um, a, a test that is you know, grade level aligned to the SBOE's content standards um, uh, that um, gives a good synthesis of grade level knowledge and skills. So on slide 32, there's another one of these um, um, questions about um, sort of the standards that they're based on um, and the assessment that it creates. That's a third grade math um, uh, test uh, question. And then on slide 33, you can see a third grade um, reading assignment. And this one is interesting because when you think about um, assessing third graders, it's, it's more, it's, it's, I think most of us have a definition of reading that is fairly narrow, like can you read? But our uh, content standards are, are broader than that. So in this case, it's can you make an inference from a poem, even as a third grader. Um, and many students can, but some of our students can't. And, um, and to, to be grade level, you have to get about half of these questions right on the STAR test. Um, uh, and I have a, a specific slide that shows you exactly how many questions you would have to be to answer right in any given grade and subject. Um, I think that's in the appendix. So. Um, uh, the, uh, in the last couple of years, we've modified significantly how we communicate to parents about the STAR test. So slide 34 shows a, uh, uh, a snippet from the current STAR report card. And the, the idea was um, what we used to tell parents um, about the STAR test was this almost indecipherable um, technical document. Like your, your kid got some score number that means nothing to anybody and like have a nice life. And I equate that to sort of you go into the doctor and the doctor says, uh, yep, yeah, you got a broken arm. Um, good luck. 
Um, and, and so there's, there's it, so what? Like, what do we do with it? So we've tried to create resources so that parents can both see how much their kid is growing, because um, that is an important part of the process, but also then how can I support my students' learning in reading and math? And so there's a lot of resources that we tried to build out um, aligned to that. We've also modified the test development process um, uh, to try to improve the integrity of the process over the last three years. We involve a lot more teachers. Um, in uh, early item developments and then we used to and there's always been teachers that have been involved in assessing is it is it the right grade level like is there is reading passage on grade level so we have, like for years there's a group of teachers they come together and they look and like I agree we as professionals agree this is on grade level um, uh, but um, now we have um, they're involved in the editing process mm -hmm. there's a there's another edit check at the end with with Texas teachers um, so we've done a, a lot more in the area of um, test development you can see on slide 36 um, some of those um, uh, things that, that are done. Um, but um, there, there is nothing magical about this current design of the STAR test. Um, we could do it a different way. Um, there are places where um, you think instead of maybe like a two-hour, um, one-day activity, we'll make it little chunks of 45 minutes that can be administered over two weeks. Totally doable. Um, it's actually not allowed under state law, but if, that, if, if you wanted to see different um, administration approaches, we could make that. Um, likewise, there's nothing that says the thing needs to be multiple choice. Um, uh, uh, you can have short answers, you can have um, open responses, you can have projects. The, the, the thing to consider about all of those, and I'm actually a fan of researching and evaluating all of those <coughs> alternative approaches, but you got to recognize uh, that ain't going to be as cheap as administering a multiple choice test. Um, the star is the, cheap, is the cheapest game in town. Um, so at slide 38 you can see um, what the cost of administration is to star compared to a couple of common assessments um, that are out there in the universe. Um, but there are clearly alternative approaches that could be taken but they will take um, several years for us to refine and develop, uh, develop and, then, and then they will need to be scaled. And, um, the, uh, I'll say that uh, when you think about that kind of option for the state from an assessment framework, some of that has uh, a lot of other ancillary benefits because, for example, if you had to say a, a bunch of short answer responses and some projects, who's going to grade those? Well, ideally, then, we bring current Texas teachers in to grade those, which means that we are, the money that we're actually spending on the assessment is actually spent training teachers on calibrating around grade level expectations um, and, and uh, assignments. And so there would be a lot of ancillary benefits from that sort of alternative approach. Um, there's also more options available with online testing that, that, is, that is adjusted. Um, we have stood up um, optional interim assessments in the last year for free for districts so that they can, they can see how students are growing over the course of the year. And we have, um, that's, that's been growing like wildfire. We're getting a lot of positive feedback from the field um, that that's, um, that that's available. So anyways, the, I, I, the only reason I bring that up is there are, you know, there, uh, you, you, there are some things where our flexibility is constrained under federal law and, and, um, and, and our use of the assessments, but there's no, there are, is actually other options to consider in terms of how assessment happens. Um, so that is a uh, high level waterfront um, and then happy to um, go into any other direction the committee sees and take questions on any and all topics. Members, <coughs> any questions? <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, members. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mike, for being here today. Appreciate the work you do. We'll look forward to working with you. And there's no other business to come before the Education Committee. We will recess subject to the call of the chair. I would. Oh, we have someone else. Okay. Mr. Porter. Gosh, got everybody all excited. And <laughs> sorry, Justin. <laughs> You would enter, are we going to have all? If you would introduce yourself for the record. I'm Justin Porter, State Director for Special Education at the Texas Education Agency. Good morning, members, and uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to keep this as exciting as possible. Uh, just sort of to set the stage, the first few slides of the slide deck talk about uh, some data points, where we are right now with special education in Texas, and then beyond that we'll talk about where we plan to go and some of the things that we're putting in place. Slide number two is a graphic that I think you all have seen before, but there's some newer data on here showing enrollment numbers for students in special education in the state of Texas. You can see a sharp decline around 2004 um, and bringing us up to 2017-18. Hold on. Yes, sir. Is this on what Commissioner Morath has given us? 
No, there's another deck, special education in Texas. There it is, I'm sorry. Gotcha. Carry on. No problem. <clears throat> but uh, what I'd like to point out is just in the last couple of years, we are in an upward trajectory in enrollment, but that's we still are significantly behind the national average. Um, I, I always want to be clear when we talk about enrolling kids in special ed and how many we are finding. It's, it's not necessarily a goal to, to match the national average because there are outliers all across there. The goal is to make sure that we find every student in Texas uh, who is eligible for special education regardless of what that number ends up being so that's really that's really our goal and it's hard for us to tie a number to it but um, the national average is sort of a benchmark for us to look at um, the next slide slide number three is shows where we are in regard to graduation rates with students in special education as you can see significantly uh, behind their non-disabled peers and unfortunately that gap seems to be widening the data for graduation rates trails by a couple of years excuse me so the most recent that we have here is 2016 but the trajectory there is definitely not going the right direction Uh, the last data slide I have here is around uh, performance on the STAR test for math and for reading, and you can see uh, that students in special education are performing significantly below their non-disabled peers. When we talk about this kind of data, I always want to sort of put a picture in everyone's mind of who it is that we're talking about. When we talk about special ed, a lot of folks um, tend to think about students who we would uh, characterize as sort of the 1% kids. These are 1% of the student population in general or about 10% of the special education population are students with significant cognitive disabilities. These are students with, with, with some serious challenges. That's not really who we're talking about when we talk about uh, expectations for academic results on STAR. About 90%, 85 to 90% of our students uh, served by special education if they're provided with the appropriate instruction and effective accommodations should be performing on grade level with their peers, uh, with their non-disabled peers. And so really, as you can see, uh, just in this graph, we have a long way to go with, uh, with regard to that. Uh, echoing something the commissioner mentioned about high expectations for all students, that is probably the number one challenge that we face in Texas with regard to special education and the students that it serves, is the fact that uh, the expectations for students in special ed are, are frequently lower than they are for other kids. And, and as soon as you lower the expectations, that, that's exactly what you're going to get. Uh, if so, I could just yes, clarify, you said 10% of the kids that we have in special ed are really cognitively disabled to the point where it's very difficult to yes, expect sir, them to be at the same level. And right. I think we all recognize that. Right. And so when you show us these trends and the gaps, are you, you're just referring to the 80, I think you said 85 to 90% of the kids yes, who should be able to. Yes, so, you, sir. so you've taken out the 10% you yes, described. Sir. Yep. So this is ones that really should be getting up to the same level. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and this graph shows star results. The students that we're talking about that are in that 1% are typically students who uh, would be assessed with the alternate assessment. So they're, okay. they're not represented in these numbers at all. I'm sorry, did you say 1% or 10%? So <laughs> it, they're 1% of the overall student population. So 1% oh, okay. okay. of the kids in Texas fall into, into that category. And that roughly translates to about 10% of students in special ed. Okay, thank you. Uh, and finally here, uh, on measures of college and career readiness, again, um, the students in special education falling significantly behind their non-disabled peers. There are multiple uh, measures that are included in this college and career readiness. Uh, could be lots of different ways to, to meet that measure, but special education students are uh, significantly behind their non-disabled peers. So now that everyone is thoroughly depressed about the state of how our students are performing in special education, let's talk about what we're going to do about it. Uh, we have several opportunities in front of us. Um, in the fall of 2017, summer and fall of 2017, we began to work in earnest in gathering some stakeholder input uh, and talking to different folks about what we needed to do to generally improve special education and supports from the state uh, across across Texas. And uh, through through that process and in, in the middle of that process, y'all are aware we received a letter of findings from the federal government outlining several of their concerns with special education in Texas and so we sort of folded those two things together and uh, went through uh, the development process of our strategic plan for special education and corrective action response to the federal findings. This, uh, the, the strategic plan is really where I'm going to focus most of my attention because that 
uh, the, the letter of findings from the, from the federal government and what we're doing to address that uh, is, is not necessarily where we're going to see the most impact on, um, on the outcomes that we've been, that we uh, talked about in the previous slides and really where we're going across the, across the, uh, across the board. The federal government um, letter of findings is being addressed through more compliance means and, and, and things of that nature rather than actually improving practice in districts. Um, so that's why we'll spend most of our time focusing on the strategic plan which can be broken up into these five general categories. Monitoring, identification, evaluation, and placement, training, support, and development, uh, student family, community engagement, and then networks and structures. Uh, the, the issue in the strategic plan most, most closely connected to the, the letter of findings from the federal government is monitoring. They pointed out uh, that uh, the state of Texas has not done do its due diligence in what we needed to do in monitoring kids uh, in special ed. And so what we've put in place for that uh, is, is a much more robust monitoring system, much more specifically focused on special education. We've added about 50 um, FTEs or staff at the agency, paid for with IDEA B discretionary funds to actually monitor districts, and we're standing up a, a new, entire new system to do that. That'll inco incorporate um, some risk analysis so that not all, not all districts are uh, require the same level of monitoring depending on the outcomes that they're getting with their kids and so the risk analysis system will help us determine exactly which districts we need to be focusing on and then from there forward it could include everything from desk audits to on-site visits uh, as far as how what we're doing with monitoring. The thing that's most unique about our plans in this area is the level of or the connection between the actual monitoring and then provision of support to these LEAs. Uh, in, in the vast majority of actually in all other states monitoring is a function that lives only in compliance all on its own and in Texas the plan uh, or the system that we're standing up is identifying areas of non-compliance and areas for improvement and then tying them directly to uh, where support can be found within the state support system for special education and so that's that is something unique that we're gonna that we plan to do and there's much more focus on improving student outcomes rather than just identifying areas of non-compliance uh, some of the things that we uh, also want to make sure are, are possible or are part of the uh, a purposeful part of the plan excuse me are transparency in the monitoring process so that stakeholders community members uh, families can really see where their LEA is in regard to implementation of the federal and state requirements around special ed so the process not only will it be uh, robust in its monitoring and rely heavily on support we're also uh, planning to have all of this information easily accessible by stakeholders Moving on past monitoring to identification, evaluation, and child or placement. So you'll hear uh, in the special ed world, you'll, this this whole area is uh, determined or I'm sorry, referred to as child find and FAPE. FAPE is uh, an acronym that I'm going to probably throw out without being able to stop myself. It's the free and appropriate public education, and it's it's what we're required to provide all students in the state of Texas. And uh, it's particularly of note when you're talking about students with disabilities, either in section served under section 504 or served by special special education. So four of the areas um, in, the, uh, in this particular piece of the plan, uh, we're requiring LA, LEAs to notify parents of students who they determine to be uh, most likely to benefit from this information around what their rights are with special ed. And so we don't know um, which kids have been missed. We don't know which kids um, need to be identified that have not yet been identified, but I'll bet that uh, teachers and administrators and folks in districts have a pretty good idea of who those kids are. And so that's why we're putting this sort of back on the LEA for them to determine, <coughs> pardon me, for them to determine who would most benefit from this information. Uh, and so they'll be, uh, th they are currently reaching out to those folks uh, in, in providing them with information about uh, what their rights might be. We're also in, um, updating technical assistance and guidance for LEAs. Uh, we've, uh, over the last two years, we have um, hired several, several new folks in the special education division. We've almost tripled in size, and that gives us a whole lot more capacity to actually provide uh, technical assistance to, uh, to LEAs and provide resources for them as they implement um, the, their requirements that are under IDEA. In particular, going forward, uh, we are creating a suite of resources. We're actually hiring a contractor to create resources around RTI, which is Response to Intervention, Section 504 in Dyslexia. This again does tie back to the corrective action response from the federal government, or the letter of findings from the federal government and our, and our response to that. 
they uh, pointed out that uh, there seems to be a lot of confusion in Texas public <coughs> schools about those three things and how they interplay and how they work with special education. And so providing clarity around that is definitely one of our goals. Senator West has a question. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I recall, that uh, this particular section or department of TEA used to have more employees. Am I correct about that? Several years ago, yes, sir. Okay. Long before my time. How, how long? Uh, I believe that was before 2011. Okay, and then those employees were cut from that section. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. And so, I um, and and now the employees that we have there, are they just kind of replacing the employees we had before 2011, or have we increased the number? Of we have we have increased. We are we now uh, as a net would have a uh, net gain of, of several employees in, the, in that division, and I wouldn't be able to give you the exact number. And that's fine. And the fact of the matter is, when we reduce the number of employees within that section, we begin to have the problems that you're trying to rectify now. Uh, I, correct? I wouldn't say they're directly related, but they're probably well, a correlation for sure. I'm not, uh, yeah. it's not I'm limited. is there a correlation? There probably would be, yes, sir. Okay. All right. And so with the additional employees that we would have in there, we should be able to uh, uh, have better outcomes. Absolutely. And so if for some reason, and, and uh, if for some reason we decide to take these employees away again, we probably will end up with the same type of problems. I would imagine so. Yes, sir. Right. Thank you. Okay. So uh, again, uh, providing those resources around uh, RTI Section 504 and dyslexia, uh, trying to provide some clarity for LEAs there with how that how that interacts. In addition to that, uh, to support efforts in, with Child Find and FAPE, we are hiring a contractor to uh, put out an outreach campaign across the state. So we're asking LEAs individually to talk to folks <coughs> who they think might benefit from more information about special ed. But as from the state level, we are going to have a, a media campaign that will uh, leverage radio and uh, social media and some other things uh, to really get information out across the state about what uh, what special education means and what folks' rights are with that. Yeah, and real quick, uh, RTI? Response to intervention, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, I knew so that, that's a that's a process. It's, I heard it. it's not necessarily part of special education. It's usually outside of special ed, but it's um, when you identify a student who's struggling, you put research-based interventions in place and then monitor progress against that. And so that can be one of the things that's used to help determine whether or not a student has a disability or whether they just need some more help with certain aspects of the curriculum. Okay. okay. Senator West? That same question. Okay. And, all, <laughs> and we've heard it, but we just hadn't heard sure, it in a couple of years. A year and a half, so actually hadn't been that long. But And also for some of the other people, you keep saying LEA, that's local education, local education which education, is basically yes, a local sir. school yes, sir. in a lot of cases. Yeah, we don't. We I, I'm pretty well trained to not say district because my charter school friends get pretty upset when I say that. So it's local education agency encompasses charters yeah. and districts. I just want to make sure everybody's on those we're done because you already brought a new one in their face. So I'm happy. <laughs> I'll right. probably do one or two more before we're done. Great. So. Put that in your glossary of terms there. Yeah. We'll get that. All right, carry on. Uh, so the outreach campaign is something we're pretty excited about. I anticipate that lasting about a year uh, and getting lots of information out to a, in a broad base across the state about what special education is, what it's meant to do, and how uh, parents who have concerns about students' uh, performance at school can access, can potentially access some of those resources and how they can start the conversation at their school. Mr. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, thank you. Inter the outreach program. And you hired a contractor to do that? We're in the process of identifying a contractor right now, yes, sir. If, if I could. Well, hold on, Senator West. Oh, uh, he, Senator Battencourt. Right, I was going to ask Senator West, um, what alliance partners do you have set up for this? And if you looked at what you're going to have is stratified marketing, you've got a whole bunch of market channels that you need to fill up, and have you looked at the, the totality of that effort because you're going across the, the, the state, which is a big place, diverse place. So have you thought about that before releasing a, an RFP? Uh, yes, sir, we, we sure have. And one of the first things that the contractor will be responsible for doing is, is a lot of that work and reporting back to us before we make decisions about exactly what's going to go where. Okay, can I, can I ask then, what is the criteria that you've already set up to pick up a sole Contractor, I don't think you're getting the inflection here. You're going to need multiple channels to the market to look at a whole variety of situations because there's not just LEAs that you're looking at. You've got communities involved, and you have um, a, a whole tapestry out there to go to look at. Yeah, so this is actually not, uh, this campaign is actually not 
intended to leverage through LEAs at all. It's sort of outside of that entire process. And so really who we're talking to are or who uh, most of the respondents to the RFP would have been uh, marketing firms and people who have, who have experience in exactly just that, of, of reaching diverse groups in, in various areas across the state. Okay, so the RFP has been out and and, and where, where, where are you in process at this point? They have, uh, responses have been scored and we are in uh, the final processes right now. Okay, so the intent is to pick we one and one only vendor. Gender. We need to drill down on okay. this. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I would suggest that potentially a little more flexibility be involved in this. Um, but, you know, I'm not trying to influence what you're doing. I'm just trying to state a, a fact because you've got, um, you, you know, it's a, I mean, it's, it's a, this is a major communications undertaking. And to be quite frank, we haven't started in a really good place. Okay. All right. And because we haven't started in a good place, we want to let that, the, you know, that go to build to a, a good future. So that's that's my concern here. So um, I just hope that uh, that we look at it with the most the most flexibility that we can. And quite frankly, you'll have different firms that are capable of doing different things for different reasons. Um, and you don't have to just ch you know choose one, um, at, at, you know, at this point in time. Senator West. So uh, in terms of and maybe this is because I've been here a long time. This seems like the same old soup warmed over again. What do I mean by that? Uh, it appeared when we had additional employees in your uh, resources, mm -hmm. uh, this is not the first time we've done a marketing campaign. Okay? That I, I, I think we've done one in the past. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do one again, but the, the, the questions are similar to what Senator Betancourt. How much is this contract for? Uh, that hasn't been determined yet. Th there's how much? How much are you set aside? Well, that's uh, <laughs> we. Are, that's not. Well, part, I can't okay. talk about that. I'm sorry. That's, it's part of no, the yes, part of contracting that's process. That's still under. And I like okay. to. I, but uh, I no one's watching. Yeah, <laughs> and, and the world's not watching. Okay. <laughs> but after after session, let's talk about that. And, and and then again, in terms of making certain that they have the experiences, and I assume that y'all are looking at the. Absolutely. That criteria. And Absolutely. Idea. Yes, sir. Are, are you responsible for awarding this, or just recommending it? So uh, the, there's a committee of folks who will be responsible for awarding it. Okay, and you don't plan on working through LEAs, working with LEAs in order to uh, to determine content. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. You have worked yeah. with them. So that's uh, again the the initial part of the contract will be in the development of the materials and including LEAs and all those are stakeholders in general, not just LEAs in in those decisions. And this is going to be awarded to one company that will be able to reach the entire state. So the, all the markets in the state. The proposals that we've had are typically it's one one marketing firm who's working with different partners to make sure that different aspects of media are covered. Is there a hub subcontracting plan? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, do you mind if uh, before y'all decide on what you're going to do that you make certain that this committee kind of get an idea of what's being done? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Sorry. So uh, moving on to slide 10, in addition to uh, the, the activities that were described on the previous slide, uh, as we go forward and, and start to draw more attention to special education, and we, we've seen this and seen uh, numbers anecdotally from LEAs about the increase in referrals for special education that have already happened, uh, we have an existing problem across the state of uh, a, a significant shortage of evaluation personnel. Those are staff who are appropriately credentialed to do the testing and uh, for students to identify them for special education. And so districts uh, and ch charter schools typically, for, for various reasons, have trouble filling those positions and oftentimes have to go outside to contractors to make that happen and so uh, that tends to get very expensive very quickly and so we've set aside ten million dollars and awarded that in a grant to ESC 20 out of San Antonio to uh, provide some uh, relief to uh, LEAs who have experienced a surge in their request for referrals and have needed to go to these outside contractors so in addition to just having some funding uh, region 20 has also negotiated statewide pricing with a lot of these with all of the contractors on the list and then LEAs uh, who participate in the program and are able to apply for a proportional reimbursement of their expenses in, in this area. So of that $10 million, $8 million of it will be spent this year and then two more has been set aside for uh, for next year because we anticipate this to continue for a while. Uh, 
training support and development, uh, in addition to the, the, the money that we're putting through to help with uh, hiring contractors and evaluation personnel, we are uh, putting out a suite of resources to help uh, existing evaluation personnel uh, do their jobs better. This, we have highly trained, highly skilled folks there, and there are limited opportunities for ongoing professional development for them. And so one of the things that uh, we plan to do as part of the strategic plan is provide resources and additional training for evaluation personnel to be sure that they're uh, doing the best job possible in identifying students who would be eligible for special ed. Uh, in addition to that, just uh, the, the probably the largest and what I think is going to be the most impactful piece of the strategic plan, and that's just my, my personal opinion, is uh, a statewide professional development that is going to be targeting, um, uh, targeting initially targeting uh, administrators, decision makers, and general educators. Uh, whenever, if you have any friends who work in special ed and you ask them who needs to know more about special ed, it's not going to be special educators. They're going to, their answer is invariably going to be folks in general ed. Uh, most kids in special ed spend 80 to 90 percent of their time in the general ed classroom and those general ed teachers uh, really need to understand how to meet the needs of students with disabilities and how to be experts at differentiation in their instruction and so this uh, professional development program uh, is, is geared towards addressing that need. Um, the in addition to the general education teachers, uh, administrators if, uh, are also have a large role to play in a campus when it comes to um, our committee meetings, whether or not students are placed in special education and how those services are provided. And so providing an extra layer of professional development for those campus administrators on how to best meet the needs of students with disabilities is also a key component of this. So, you know, looking at the dyslexia particularly, we, we hear that number is increasing. Uh, and a lot of that is in general ed where kids are having difficulty reading. Do you think, of, would you imagine a large part of our underreporting of special ed is in the dyslexic area? Yes, sir, I would. As, so, as we move forward, I think that, that so is one of the groups more. that we're going to see. So we do need to train our general ed teachers on how to identify students with dys dyslexia, and particularly earlier on. Uh, do you think our number, because you, you said, stated earlier our you know, special ed population is about 10 percent, with the increasing in dyslexia, do you think that number will get higher than 10%? So this past year, we're at, we're at about 9.2% in, uh, in the fall of 2017. We don't have firm numbers from 2018 yet. Uh, but I, I think that a proportion of that will certainly be students with dyslexia. Students with dyslexia, just like as students with any disability, may be appropriately served in general ed with little to no accommodations. They may need protection under Section 504, or they may need special education services. Any, any kid with any disability might fall into one of those categories. And dyslexia is just, just like any other one in Texas. Um, more often than not, students with dyslexia have been served outside of special education, and we're seeing that change for sure. Yeah. Well, of course, that's going to help us on our getting our third grade reading at third grade level. We can identify those who are having the difficulty because of dyslexia. For sure. And then through the general education program, uh, I know that uh, the, in the previous legislative session, uh, legislation was passed about dyslexia screeners, uh, and that, that work is happening through the gen general education program, and I think that's also going to have an impact. Finding those kids earlier and providing services to them um, at the earliest time possible is absolutely, we know that's the best way to go. Yes, sir. Sir West. And, and remind me, is there some sort of systematic program to do that assessment, or is that just on a case-by-case -case basis? So the screener is going to be universal. There will be universal screeners, and there's information about that in the in the newly adopted uh, dyslexia handbook that the state board uh, revised and put out last fall. Okay, just give us a, a high level in terms of how, how it's going. Uh, every work. every kid through uh, kinder and first grade will will be screened for dyslexia. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, in addition, I think I've mentioned some of this already, we uh, are creating more resources around RTI Dyslexia Section 504, and also on the slide mentions what I was just discussing about dyslexia, and that the, uh, the um, State Board has revised and, and adopted a new uh, dyslexia handbook. Sir Wes? That's true. Uh, it's already been adopted and re uh, yes, revised sir. and adopted? Yes, sir. And there, I guess they're... Parents could go on that site to find where they can download the. Yes, handbook. sir. They sure can. Yep. Okay, on the state board site, but uh, TEA. It's well. uh, it's linked from both. So if they, if you go to the TEA website and do a search for dyslexia, there's an entire dyslexia page that'll come up, and it's linked from there for as well. Very good. Yep. 
training support and development in addition to the, some of the things we've already talked about. Special Education Division is working closely with our uh, educators, our colleagues in educator support and the State Board for Educator Certification to increase requirements uh, in that aspect for pre-service teachers uh, who are not necessarily seeking a special education certification but even just a general ed certification need to have a foundation of knowledge and how to meet the needs of students with disabilities in particular um, and also calling out students with dyslexia as well early on in that in that general education uh, certification process. Uh, in addition to that we are working continuing to work in training school boards. Uh, school boards have a tremendous amount of authority when it comes to local policy around uh, special education and just uh, can also set the culture and tone for the district around how students with disabilities are treated and, and viewed within the district and so training uh, school boards is also a critical component of that. Um, statewide partnerships we're continuing to we currently have a strong partnership with the Texas Workforce Commission uh, and I meet regularly with colleagues at the Texas, Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board but we're looking of course to continue that uh, and partner with other state agencies who might have an impact um, on, on the services received by students with disabilities. We are using, uh, not, we are not using, we are partnering with the Texas Workforce Commission. They have uh, funds available to them from the federal government for the Workforce Innovations Opportunities Act, or WIOA, uh, that uh, we are helping them leverage across the state to provide services to students with disabilities in the, in the area of transition. So what are these kids going to do after high school? Uh, and they are, they'll start those, uh, those resources and trainings available for students in 8th grade uh, and rolling up through 12th grade going forward. Student family and community engagement is definitely an area of improvement across the state. Uh, we are uh, producing with uh, the help of some contractors some uh, paper and web based products that will provide parents and stakeholders with a tremendous amount of information about special education and things that they could look for uh, when uh, with in regard to the performance of their individual child but also uh, the idea behind this is to help parents and stakeholders uh, families feel more empowered when they walk into the schoolhouse to feel less intimidated by this by this committee meeting that they're part of uh, and be able to have some of the language and understand and um, uh, what's actually happening, of course, that burden does uh, not burden that uh, does fall back to the school district as well to the LEA to make sure that they're making that uh, that uh, that parent uh, feel as comfortable as possible and as empowered as possible. But providing resources from the outside uh, is also going to help with that. Um, I've mentioned it feels like I'm beating a, a dead horse with clarification of Section 504 dyslexia and RTI, but that just speaks to how important we feel that that is. So that work is going out through this part of the initiative as well. And then um, uh, we have currently existing a call center, uh, SpedTex, uh, which is um, run through a grant with Region 10 and Richardson. That is a, a call center for parents and families, actually anyone, any stakeholder with, uh, who has questions about special ed can call and speak to a special education expert and get their questions answered there. We are planning several enhancements to that uh, for next year going forward. How do people, how, how are they made aware of that? So uh, on, on everything that we put out, from uh, as far as that's intended for the general public to see, we are we are publicizing that number. But that also will feature um, broadly in the outreach campaign that's happening, and then all of the resources on the next slide. I'll be talking about some of the networks and structures that are putting out all of the resources that are intended to be outward facing. We'll carry that logo and that information going forward. We do. Um, we, we do struggle to get folks to know about it. It just it just seems to be one of those things. Whenever I have a chance to stand in front of a group of educators or a group of parents, I ask how many folks know about it, and I've seen the number of hands going up a little bit anecdotally over the last year or so, but we definitely have work to do there to make sure it happens. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that the outreach campaign will help a lot. We certainly that. don't need a secret call center. Exactly. Nobody needs a secret call center that nobody knows about. Yep. <laughs> it is government, so it's an oxymoron. <laughs> Uh, lastly, the technical assistance networks. So for the last about 16 or 17 years, the way that TEA supported LEAs uh, with special education uh, or in their implementation of requirements of special ed was through a network of, of um, 16 different leadership networks that were all held by uh, in either institutes of higher ed or ESCs across the state. And each one of those leadership networks um, came to being in response to a need. And so there was never a comprehensive look at how all of those supports work together and how they could be done more effectively and more efficiently. And so that is what's happened now. Uh, beginning at, uh, when we first began the discussions around uh, creating the strategic plan for special education, one of the first things we looked at was how those networks are put together. We started to gather stakeholder input and feedback on how that could look different going forward and where we could gain some efficiencies and improve effectiveness. And so those 
six, the work of those 16 networks has been distilled down to now the 10 networks that you see listed here. And in addition to that existing work, there are two networks here that represent relatively new work uh, that is definitely in response to needs that we've heard from stakeholders. If you'll uh, call your attention to Network 8, st Support for Students in Small and Rural LEAs. And so that work, uh, half of the school districts in the state of Texas, so roughly 600 districts, serve less than 1,000 kids. And so when you have uh, limited numbers of students, your resources are limited, but that doesn't change the fact that the students with disabilities and those uh, LEAs are entitled to the same level of, of services that students, that their uh, peers in a larger district would, would have access to. And so how can we leverage resources and, and, and use things uh, more wisely to make that happen? So that's going to be the charge of, of that network to help figure some of that out. And then also Network 10. Uh, um, supports for students with multiple exceptionalities and multiple needs. I myself started my career in education as a bilingual teacher and I can remember uh, clearly having students in my class that I knew needed something. They needed something beyond what I could provide them in the general education setting and when I would talk to administrators about it I would be told that student hasn't been in the country for three years yet we can't evaluate him for special education and that is just a that is that is not a truth that is not a real thing um, but it is sort of this feeling that people have of it, it's very difficult to discern in a student the difference between a language difference and a disability sometimes depending on what you think the disability might be and so that is a difficult thing to discern but that doesn't mean it's not possible to do so and so this uh, network is exists to help support LEAs not only in the identification of, uh, of those students but also in providing them with the most appropriate services and so, real, real quick on your example why would an administrator not want to do that because of the difficulty in discerning the difference between a, a language, I'm sorry, the differ, differential between a language difference and a disability, because it's very difficult to even even if you're testing, uh, even if you're testing a student in, Spain, in their first language, in this case it would have been Spanish, uh, it's still difficult to determine whether it's related to a disability, whether it's a language difference, and also a key factor there is educational opportunity. Many I was teaching in a very high poverty school, and most of the students that we had were recent immigrants and they came with little to no background in their first language, which means they haven't had much educational opportunity, and that is it, the, all of that together does make it very difficult to identify. But, but your experience as a bilingual teacher, you could tell some students needed something beyond yeah. typical. Yeah, and it's just from working with a student every day, all day. I just day. don't understand why an administrator would not want to see We talk about the end of reporting. I'm just trying yeah. to figure out where this comes from. And yeah. That's not like under reporting right there. If, you, if you've identified as a teacher who teaches bilingual, mm -hmm. And some kids are different than the other bilingual For kids sure. and they need something more. Yes, sir. Why would an administrator not want to do that? So the one of the one of the other th things that's at play when you're looking at uh, students who are identified for special education is uh, are students in, are in particular student groups identified at a disproportionate rate? And so in Texas at one point, um, and in still in some school districts in Texas at one point, you have a much higher rate of English learners identified with special ed than non-English learners identified with special ed. And so what that unless you believe that kids who don't know English have a disability, then, I mean, it, it, which I certainly don't believe, it, it tells you that we're identifying kids that really don't need special ed and, and not doing a good enough job of discerning the difference between a language difference and a disability. And so as we had those higher numbers, then, of course, that was brought to light and that pushed folks to make to try okay. and be more careful about identifying English learners. And so, um, as is often the case, when we are faced with something very difficult and very complex, people who people look for, like, a one-size-fits-all, a black-and-white answer to it, and that would be the answer but to that I, question. But I would hope, with our more emphasized efforts towards identifying yes, these kids that that situation would not happen again. Absolutely. That's, that they would that's be screened the goal. and we could identify them because they very well could be dyslexic or something else. Absolutely. That's and absolutely you're identifying those, those, so hopefully that doesn't continue in the future. Yes, sir. And that, and that is not only, you know, one of my personal passions of mine, it's also the, pretty much the major purpose of this network is to help in that identification exactly. and providing services. Thank you, and, and thank you. Senator Battencourt. Uh, thank you. You know, to add on to this, the the granularity of what you're looking at, or I guess the, the individual, uh, you know, student, could range from somebody that's in the autistic spectrum, okay, maybe diagnosed, non-diagnosed, okay, and some of those kids would be in the old GT program, mm -hmm. potentially, um, and be, or, and, or be very socially awkward, you know, awkward. I think we've gotten rid of the, uh, the, some of the other diagnosis names, Asperger's, et cetera. I think that's all been dropped. So when you're looking at that type of broad-based autism spectrum, and we've got one in 88 children now getting diagnosed with that, 
I mean, that also kind of plays into special, you know, education too. True. Absolutely, yes, sir. So, I, so I, I mean, it's a difficult thing even for trained professionals and PhDs to be able to diagnose. So, how do we try to, you know, how do we try to get those kids in the right slot? That, that's absolutely, you're exactly correct. It's difficult, and that is another focus of this network. Would be, uh, what you mentioned gifted and talented education. We are uh, students with disabilities are are. Um, vastly underrepresented in our gifted and talented numbers in the states, and there's, there's, that's for no reason. There's, you know, a student may, may very well have a disability that affects one area and be gifted in another. Just at the same, we should expect that number to be the same as it is for the general student population. All right. That's is that it. That's it. Any other questions I can address? Try to address. Senator Paxton. Well, I just want to uh, thank you for your testimony today and yes, for being here and for the great work you've been doing. I know, you know, uh, Commissioner Marath talked about how great teachers drive um, student achievement, and that is definitely true. That's one of the, the one great factors, big factors in student achievement. But the other one is engaged parents. Absolutely. And, um, you know, for for student achievement and, and uh, reaching out to our parents, I think that's maybe no... No more, nowhere more important and more needed than with our uh, special ed uh, population. I, I fall into that category myself as a parent. Mm -hmm. um, I was an educator, but um, one of my four children is dyslexic. And we were very blessed to have uh, a teacher in, that, that actually taught my daughter first grade and second grade, moved up with the class, and called me in and said, hey, I think we need to, to look at this. And um, I wouldn't have noticed it. But we were able to catch that before third grade for her. Uh, she went on to be, you know, in National Honor Society in high school, and now she's a senior at Texas A&M. She's going to be an English teacher. So I think, you know, the the leveraging, um, focusing on dyslexia, in particular, uh, which is is so prevalent, um, and I think um, it's it's emerging. It's it's difficult to to know. Is it increasing? Are we just identifying it? Um, better I don't know but I do appreciate the the focus there because it it really does um, I think it leverages on so many points um, that make a difference and I, I do want to thank you for your great work in this in this uh, area and I look forward to working with you to to help improve that experience for families and for kids thank you yes, well thank you thank you for being here today Absolutely. Um, those of you who are setting your DVR for future episodes are probably longer than this one. Um, assuredly. <laughs> almost assuredly. Uh, but anyway, if there's no other business coming before the committee today, we will recess subject to call the chair. Thank you all members.